Okay, hi there. Welcome to a growth and development profile video. And uh, we're going to spend a few minutes looking at the fast growing country of Rwanda. Uh, this economy is entering a crucial stage of progress as they reach the 25th anniversary of the genocide in 1994. A quick background on Rwanda. It is landlocked, an East African nation, and 25 years ago, there was a, a, a hugely appalling genocide in which over 800,000 people died. President Paul Gadami has just been re-elected to serve a seven-year term, his third term in office. There are uh, some residual issues about human rights and uh, political freedoms in Rwanda, which I won't focus on necessarily too much in this economics video. Uh, Rwanda aspires to reach middle-income country and high-income status by 2035 and 2050, respectively. Uh, but it is actually a low-income nation at the moment. As a result of fast growth over the past 25 years, per capita income has trebled. Uh, but despite this, uh, living standards measured by per capita GNI and making that important PPP adjustment, they remain below the average for sub-Saharan Africa. That said, the government under Kagame is, uh, is committed to maintaining a high, inclusive and sustainable rate of growth, which of course offers a huge number of opportunities, but also raises significant policy challenges. Rwanda is one of those countries which is a member of the 7% club, a rate of growth averaging just close to 7%. Of course, if you grow at 7% per year, you double the size of your GDP every decade. And faster growth not only helps to lift people more quickly out of extreme poverty, but should also improve health and education outcomes, lifting the HDI score, as well as a wider range of uh, and access to better goods and services. Now, Rwanda's growth, actually, looking at this chart, it's pretty impressive, is uh, the average has been 7.8% since 2000. Now, that's the third highest in sub-Saharan Africa and actually exceeds the average of emerging Asian countries. The key question, of course, is can it be sustained in the years to come? Just a quick comparison of where Rwanda is in terms of their GNI per capita. You can see that they are still uh, in that low human development uh, category. So they've got somewhere to go to get to medium human development, which would require $6,000 per capita. The very high labour participation rate for females may reflect the dominance of farming in total employment. So we'll quickly look at uh, some really key development indicators for Rwanda. Note that despite per capita incomes tripling in the last two decades or more, they still have a very low HDI ranking. The latest figure is 157. Economic reforms in health and education are designed to improve their HDI score over the next five to seven years. But uh, that needs to be achieved pretty quickly. The Rwandan economy is actually highly dependent on remittances, inward foreign direct investment and overseas aid for their development finance. National savings as a share of GDP remain very low and certainly well below gross investment as a share of national income. Hence, the country has a, a, quite a significant need for external financing to cover the savings gap. Three quarters of the Rwandan employed population earn less than $3.20 a day PPP, which is the new World Bank definition of extreme working poverty. Life expectancy collapsed in the mid-1990s, of course, following the genocide, but actually has recovered strongly in recent years and is now uh, heading above 67. Our second set of development indicators are shown on the right-hand side here. Uh, well, a couple of interesting things to, to feature for you. First of all, in terms of income inequality, the Gini coefficient actually has fallen quite significantly uh, in the last 10 years in Rwanda. Um, and the government is committed to inclusive growth, which means that we should focus on the income, education and health outcomes of the poorest two quintiles in the population. At the moment, uh, the bottom 40% of the population accumulate only 16% of the income, and the richest 10% have 36% of the income. So there's quite a significant income gap there. Uh, another aspect is tax revenues. Uh, tax revenues remain a small percentage of GDP. Uh, less than 15% of GDP is taken in tax. 
Now we can expect that to rise as per capita incomes increase and perhaps the government is more effective in introducing electronic payment systems and tax collection, tax collection systems and so on. A border tax base is important for low income countries. Uh, it seems slightly counterintuitive, but the tax revenues need to go up in low income countries if you can to help finance basic public services, uh, including, a, including a welfare safety net. Quick look at some of the key macroeconomic indicators for Rwanda. Fast growth, yes. Inflation, relatively low. It's been higher, but the inflation target is 5%, plus or minus 3%, and the current inflation rate is, is 4%. Unemployment in Rwanda is very high, 15%. <clears throat> Officially, 15%, because we know that hidden unemployment and underemployment is also a major problem. And 75% of young people don't have a job, which clearly is both an economic, social and political issue. Uh, the other thing I want to focus on a little bit is the current account balance, which is very large by international standards. And, and Rwanda is running a persistently big current account on the balance of payments. Now, to some extent, that's covered finance, if you like, by high levels of inward FTI, although those are not guaranteed. But notice there's a big gap between... Uh, sorry, sorry, some of the current account deficit is in part due to the fact that they're growing quickly and therefore having to import more goods and services, including importing the capital machinery, for example, to build the international airports. There's also a big gap between investment spending, you can see the bottom there, and gross national savings as a share of GDP. Investment is much higher than the savings rate. Uh, that needs to be covered, obviously, by inflows of development finance. Uh, Rwanda has 41% external debt. Now, that external debt has more than doubled over the last 10 years. And that does make the economy vulnerable to the effects of currency depreciation and perhaps a period of rising interest rates. The Rwandan government issued a euro bond in 2013 and repayment is due soon. In terms of share of GDP, actually what's interesting here is there's been relatively little change in, if you like, the structure or the pattern of Rwandan GDP over the last 10, 11 years. Um, services, 48% dropped actually to 46%, a little bit of an increase in, in manufacturing as a share of GDP. But farming has, has maintained its share of national income. It's still at or around 30% of GDP. And indeed, more than three quarters of the labour force earns its living directly or indirectly from, from agriculture. The pattern of Rwandan exports, I think, reflects that. Obviously, still a, this is just goods, not services, but uh, just under half of all Rwandan exports are linked to coffee and tea, a little bit of cut flowers there, of other vegetables and uh, the ore industry exports, etc. But Rwanda, of course, is clearly still a major agricultural export uh, country and therefore vulnerable to changes in the terms of trade caused by fluctuating global prices. For those commodities. The key thing really as we move into the second half of this this uh, this look at Rwanda is to think about the future and how Rwanda is trying to change its economy. It's growing quickly, uh, they need uh, to maintain the quantity of growth but of course they also need to focus on the quality and the composition of growth. Here are five key points taken from their latest seven-year plan, their structural transformation plan. Uh, the first is the government wants to increase employment in and investment in uh, human capital. So investment in STEM and vocational training, science, technology, uh, English and mathematics. Uh, Rwanda is, is, has a very low rate of urbanisation. I think the latest figure I saw was only 17% urbanisation. And no country on the planet has grown rich without urbanising first. So managing land rights, managing urbanisation upgrading the infrastructure of Kigali, major city, and developing and building secondary cities is crucial to their long-term supply-side uh, pro um, process. And of course, crucial for Rwanda is to move up the value chain, to shift production and the export base a little bit away from basic farming towards higher value-added goods and services, um, including 
things like uh, manufacturing, we'll come to some examples in a second, and services, including financial services and tourism. A key aim is to increase domestic savings. Uh, that will happen a little bit automatically if per capita incomes continue to rise, but also to expand financial service access to the bulk of the population. And farming will remain a key part of the Rwandan economy. So again, the short to medium term aim is to improve farming productivity, better irrigation, better use of pesticides, crop rotation, microfinance insurance for farmers and developing a commercial agribusiness, commercial horticulture which can generate the economies of scale needed to lift productivity. Uh, oftentimes in exams you get little questions saying explain or examine how the financial sector can support growth and development. And I, I think Rwanda is a good example of that to use in your revision notes. Uh, the government has just introduced a, a long-term savings scheme to try to provide basic pension benefits to half the population. Uh, they are quite heavily involved in a little bit in government helped, government sponsored uh, financial uh, microfinance, microcredit. So a risk sharing scheme to increase bank financing and insurance, electronic platforms to help their farmers buy the raw materials, buy the fertilizer, buy the seeds and repay loans. There has been a dramatic increase in the scale of um, electronic finance in, in uh, Rwanda, helped by the rapid rise of mobile money. So that uh, one of the aims is to promote a cashless economy uh, where taxes are paid uh, and the value of e-money has, has certainly climbed dramatically in the last few years. Uh, a key aim is to, to make uh, the financial system uh, better able to inform people when they're trying to start their own businesses. So better financial information and crucially uh, financial policies to develop commodity markets to, het, to help set spot and futures prices. So there's lots of spot markets in the markets for coffee and tea, but can you develop a futures market which can help uh, farmers hedge their risks and uh, potentially improve trade intra-regionally, particularly in the context of the continental free trade area. Crucial, I think, to uh, understanding the Rwandan growth and development prospects for the years ahead are the various supply side policies that the government has introduced initiatives that have been launched. Uh, with a population of 12 million, you can make a case for saying that three international airports is perhaps too many, but they have built three international airports, cargo friendly, to, to try to overcome the limitation of being landlocked, but also, of course, to, uh, to fast track their burgeoning tourist industry. What's really interesting in the last few years is the number of American universities have established uh, campuses in, in Africa. Uh, Stanford is one. Carnegie Mellon University Africa established um, a campus in 2011 in Rwanda specifically to, to, to try to invest in creative and technically capable engineers. The African Institute for Mathematical Science opened in 2016 and Rwanda is a really good example of a country to use that is be, starting to uh, use special economic zones to encourage light manufacturing, uh, building a dry port, top-end tourist hotels, etc. Indeed, on the supply side, Rwanda has made some significant progress. This is Carnegie Mellon University, Africa. It is the, um, the new campus nestled in the hills outside Kigali, 6,000 square metres. Uh, it's actually located within the Kigali Innovation City. Again, another good example to use. That's a sort of government-private partnership. Uh, that is trying to lift the Rwandans' position as a knowledge-based economy uh, within Africa and perhaps even globally. Uh, Rwanda has made significant progress in making it easier to do business. This is the World Bank's annual report. Indeed, the latest figures suggest that Rwanda is the only low-income country in the top 50 of the latest World Bank Ease of Doing Business report. And after Mauritius, it's the second easiest place to do business in Africa. Really good bit of contextual evidence here, particularly if you're looking to support an essay on the economics of foreign direct investment. Here are a couple of examples of development projects in action taken from the wonderful James Hall, the Reuters correspondent. Some of you may well be aware, of course, that the Rwandan government effectively sponsored an advertising campaign with several leading 
uh, Premier League and uh, European uh, leading European football clubs. Uh, I think something like 40 million euros spent on advertising with Paris Saint-Germain, with Arsenal. Some evidence this led to quite a significant boost in in tourism. Uh, here on the right hand side, uh, Qatar will own 60% of the new international airport in Bogusera. Uh, the joint deal uh, will handle 7 million passengers annually. This is a important infrastructure project designed, of course, to uh, encourage light manufacturing through containers, freight and things, and also encourage tourism. Here's a really good example of uh, inward investment. So uh, Rwanda is the first African country to start building, um, not just assembling, but building electric vehicles. So Volkswagen um, uh, and Siemens, a joint venture to, uh, to launch the e-Golf. Important example to use. Uh, here's the Kigali Special Economic Zone, uh, where of course you have various tax advantages from having businesses come into your country. Uh, a couple of really good examples. So Mara Phones, designed in partnership with Google, are being now being assembled in Rwanda. Light manufacturing in that sense, the first Africa's sm first smartphone launched in the country. And uh, a deal with the Chinese firm Pink Mango to set up a garment factory. Again, look at the impact of that. 7,000 jobs. Um, and the hope is that's going to create extra, a sort of capacity, not just employment in, in Rwanda to lift the capita incomes, but productive capacity and output for exporting out of the country. And Rwanda's Mara Group has just launched two smartphones, describing them as the first made in Africa models. Uh, Rwanda has a made in Rwanda strategy designed to try and attract manufacturing capacity and uh, develop a regional technology hub. So there's some good examples of, of things that are actually happening on the ground in the country, which are potentially both employment and export and growth enhancing. So some positive news, but uh, just quickly, let's think about the structural weaknesses of the country. It's important always to consider some of the barriers to growth and development in countries such as Rwanda. First of all, of course, it's landlocked. So it still remains one of the most expensive places for a container to reach, hence the need to invest heavily in cargo friendly airports. The, uh, the economy as a whole has fairly low reliability, low access to and the high cost of broadband. Cost of electricity remains some of the highest on the continent, along with fairly regular outages of, of supply. One of the reasons why Rwanda is 157 on the HDI is there are clearly significant weaknesses in human capital, particularly uh, outside the non-farming sector of the economy. And the country as a whole remains highly dependent on commodity prices globally and international overseas aid, which is last year, I think, over 12% of GDP. So why might you use Rwanda in an exam essay? As a, as a really good contextual example. Well, it's a fast growing country. It's, in, it's joined the 7% club. It's a low income nation. Uh, the big, but think about the big challenge of financing, continuing to, to finance fast growth, particularly when domestic savings are low. It's a really good example to think about how a country is trying to diversify the economy, move away from primary sector dependence towards light manufacturing and services, including financial services and tourism. It's a great country to think about when you're evaluating the impact of FDI on their growth potential because over the last 10 years, they've averaged 4.5% of GDP in with, in with FDI. Uh, Rwanda, of course, is part of the new African Continental Free Trade Area, CFTA, which, of course, was signed in Kigali. So to what extent is Rwanda going to benefit from increased intra-African trade and investment? And it's also a really good example to think about in terms of the way that basic financial services can help promote growth and development. So there we go. Hopefully you've uh, enjoyed this growth and development profile on Rwanda. It's a really fascinating country. The politics is difficult. Um, but it's certainly a good example to use of a country that where fast growth, hopefully in the future, will feed through to significantly better development outcomes.